to Behind the Lens. Uh, this is a virtual program the Museum of Contemporary Photography has been holding since, um, well, since the lockdown in March. Um, so we host different photographers and they take us into a sort of virtual studio visit um, and talk about their, their work. Um, I'm Dalina Perdomo Alvarez, currently Curatorial Fellow for Diversity in the Arts at the Museum of Contemporary Photography. And I've curated the show Temporal, Puerto Rican Resistance, which is up now until September 19th. Uh, here it is. And today I'm here with Erika Fer Rodriguez, who is an exhibiting artist in the show. Um, the show includes her work on Hurricane Maria and uh, the protests in Puerto Rico, particularly the Renuncia protests from summer of 2019. And she will be discussing that, but also um, more of her work, uh, not limited to the to the hurricane and um, and the protest. Um, and then just a bit about Erika. She is a documentary photographer from San Juan, Puerto Rico, and her photography explores topics of community identity and countering the stereotypical representation of the Caribbean. And her work has appeared in the New York Times, CNN, The Washington Post, Bloomberg, NPR, Smithsonian Magazine, among others. Um, so she will be presenting for us today. Um, you can use the chat to ask questions. Feel free to type in questions throughout, but we will have, um, we will leave 10, 15 minutes at the end. Um, we're all sort of come back in. I'm going to turn off my screen now so Erika can have uh, <laughs> the whole focus, but then um, I'll come back at the end uh, to read the questions out loud for, for Erika. So definitely feel free to ask questions. And yeah, I would, actually, I would actually like if people have questions, you can totally interrupt me and have mm -hmm. it more of a conversation than, than just like the Q&A at the end. You know, if there's any questions that mm -hmm. happen uh, throughout interrupt me and we can just talk talk um talk yeah. about it so let me know i prefer i prefer that you know and then at the end we can just go over the conversations that we have but let's okay. let's plan on doing that so people okay. are feel free to like you know join in the conversation more than just like listen to me talk here yeah if you see if you see like chat questions popping up and you want to say like oh let's take a break for questions i can like okay. turn my screen back on and read them out loud so for you if, you, if you prefer, or if you prefer to read them, you can do that as well. But at the end, I'll, I'll come back in as, as, to do a formal, formal Q&A. But yeah, everyone feel free to feel like you're in a studio visit with Erika and, and ask questions or make comments. <laughs> okay, so, so I guess I'll disappear for- <laughs> Okay, thank you, Elena. <laughs> and thank you for having me. Um, it's gonna feel a little bit of a, like a monologue, but let's do this. And okay, here we go. Can you allow me to share my screen? There. Here we go. So we try to do the captions. Um, let's see if those work. Um, so I'm gonna introduce, I mean, thank you for the introduction, Dalina. And yes, so I'm a freelance photographer based in San Juan, Puerto Rico. I've been uh, here working full time as a freelance photographer um, and photojournalist for the past five years. And I grew up in Puerto Rico. I spent six years in California where I studied photography and worked a little bit at the LA Times. And 2015, I decided to move to Puerto Rico and, you know, pursue my career as a photographer here, telling the stories of the place that is home. So first I'm going to share, um, some photos from my personal project called The Oldest Colony that I've been photographing for about seven years. Um, pretty much everything fits into this. 
Um, then I'm going to show some some from Hurricane Maria, then Ricky Renosia, and uh, a little bit at the end from the earthquakes of earlier this year. So this actually is one of the frames that began the project of the oldest colony and it's a long-term project that I've been doing for about seven years. Um, it started while I was doing an internship at the local newspaper El Nuevo Día in Puerto Rico. And the project is, is a meditation on the Puerto Rican identity to the framework of our colonial relationship with the United States. Um, and I'm always in the photos searching for that like underlying um, mild tension uh, that, that for me expresses um, our political limbo and political identity crisis as a unincorporated territory of the United States. Um, I began to, to cover this, you know, to make these images as a process to understand my own experience as a Puerto Rican and as a Puerto Rican photographer, like what did it mean to like photograph Puerto Rico and turn the camera to, to a little bit to myself, even if I wasn't photographing me, I was, I was like trying to search for something that was within um, a, an internal struggle. Uh, so, and the work has built into a documentation of like, everyday life and protests and politics and the economic crisis and disasters and a lot of assignment work too that I've done that actually fits into this project. Um, I think that, you know, like we, we have a very strong cultural identity, you know, Puerto Rico has a strong cultural identity and our cultural production, you know, it's that place where we reaffirm and stre strengthen exactly that, that we are Puerto Rican and that's part of, of inherent to us, um, not just because of the island that we exist in, but because of the framework and, and all the complexity of how Puerto Rico exists politically. Um, so like no, no Puerto Rican doubts is Puerto Rican, but if we go into being American or not, it's a longer conversation and it can, you know, bring up a ton of emotions and have people fight. And um, it's, it's part of like, I think the, a little bit of the madness of being Puerto Rican um, that, that any Puerto Rican can tell you we all have. Um, so the comparing our, our cultural identity to our political identity, which is completely different, right? Um, and that's the reason for this project because, you know, we exist under the discretion of Congress um, and they hold old authority over us. You know, we had the fiscal board imposed in 2016 that oversees all the public spending of the government. Um, right now we have no idea how long it will be. They still haven't been able to create a balance, one year of balanced budget. Um, so it might be in for a long time and it's really effect, starting to affect a lot of people and, and, and the economic crisis just keeps worsening with uh, natural disasters and now the pandemic. Um, I wanted to say that this, if there's any questions about specific images, let me see if I can pop up the, I actually don't think I can pop up the chat while doing screen share Dalina. So if you, let me see. Can I? No. I can, if something comes in, I can let you know. Like, okay. Yeah. I just wanted question. to see, I was going to try, but I don't think it's, can you see the full screen or are you, wait, sorry guys. I'm trying. There I, can, we go. I can see the full screen and I can also see the chat. So, so if okay, awesome. pops up, I'll keep an eye on the chat. <laughs> Yeah, so, so all of these images are from like different, different years, I'm sorry, they're not the, they're, um, that I've started in 2012 and I like, you know, continued on, this was part of an assignment um, in one school and when in the first wave of closures from public schools 
in 2017, so the year of the hurricane, but before. Um, and we went into a school that was going to have uh, receive a ton of, of students from like two closing schools that were nearby. Um, and, and when I made this image, I didn't really like pay attention to the zeros in in the middle of the the multiplication that the girl was doing. And for me, it just you know, it was that other layer that I honestly was not paying attention. I was more paying attention to her. Um, but afterwards, it really caught my attention to like you know, it's like little things that can like hint into um, our reality, even if it's not like literal. As a photographer, I think I, I, I struggle and I think it's part of, I mean, maybe of any Puerto Rican that identifies itself as a, you know, colonized land, um, that it's a, it's, it's a process for me to, through photography, to like decolonize the way I see myself and I, how I see Puerto Rico. And, and that's something that I'm learning and I learned through photographing and I learn, and I don't, maybe I'll continue to learn till the last, the day I die um, and be, because I'm always trying to like question myself how do we create and construct the identity of Puerto Rico and what that visual is um, like what are the visuals that that get pushed out right into either media or books or stories of, of who Puerto Rico is and I think I one of the, I mean, covering from the, for the news and international news and national in the United States, I think I've always uh, very consciously tried my best um, to try to break from the narrative um, that too long or too often is put on us that we Puerto Ricans are inferiors and lazy and beggars and violent and corrupt and above anything else, unable to govern ourselves. So. Uh, I'm not going to deny that Puerto Rico has many issues internally, but but there's a I, I think there's there's a job that we also need to do in in countering those narratives um, because they're not they're stereotypical and they're not real and they're not honest about um, the lives of Puerto Ricans. Um, oh, I had a. Uh question myself I, I was, I was yeah. wondering if you could uh, tell people about why the kid was holding a rooster <laughs> oh yeah this is this is um this is a family in, in Otuado um and this was photographed for a story for NPR about the the ban of cockfighting um so book cockfighting was banned last year by federal um by the federal government in Puerto Rico, it was banned everywhere in the everywhere else in the United States, but not in its territories. And then they they passed an amendment in um, twenty nineteen, late twenty nineteen, to ban um, cockfighting in all the territories. Um, that said, none of the territories have any voting power on Congress, so it was a law that affected them, but they had no say. They could speak, but they had no actual power to make any influence or decision into this. Um, so this is a family who sustain themselves from cockfighting. They uh, raise uh, the animals and train them. And in the back of the house, they had probably about 200. And it was a, like a family thing. Um, Jose Papo Torres, which is the, the, um, the man in the middle of the picture, he's he's the one that like is in charge of, of everything and then his wife helps him whenever she can um and the kids are involved whenever and they're not in school they're involved they also have their own animals they have some of the chicks that are like smaller so they're they grown up in this culture um of cockfighting and that's why he's holding that's like his favorite um animal out of all the ones i think it was his own and he was very proud of it so I, this is one of the photos that I did for that story. And 
I try, I mean, this photo, it's like, it's very old. It's probably one of the first ones I did. And I had, I still keep it. And I've, I had when, when I was starting and doing more portfolio reviews, I think most people told me to take it out um, because of different reasons. I've always kept it. I'm not going to say it's like the best image out there, but it just, it, it just holds a deep meaning for me. There's something about that separation of the frame um, of families. And, you know, at that time I wasn't living in, I was in living in Puerto Rico, I was in California and I knew that the, the, the migration was a serious deal. It was still not being reported in numbers, you know, the brain drain and the, the massive migration was still not being reported, but I could see it with my friends and family and people I knew that everybody was leaving. And so this project, it's um, in the means of being a book. I'm super excited and scared, to be honest, because I've never done this. <laughs> Um, but, but I'm really excited to, to work on something, um, for, uh, for us to look at. Um, I think, uh, early on, I decided that my audience was mainly Puerto Rico and Puerto Ricans because we don't have a big culture of photo books, uh, that, that are documentary style that, you know, show us a daily life of Puerto Rico and how things look like, you know, now, um, and what does that visual language and narrative say about the times that we're living? So I'm gonna jump into some of the stuff from Hurricane Maria. I, this was my first hurricane season. I had never covered a hurricane until 2017. Um, that I, I cover Hurricane Irma in Puerto Rico and then in the Virgin Islands, US and British. And then a few days later, we, we had announced that Hurricane Maria was gonna hit Puerto Rico directly. And we, no, nobody had an idea of, of, of you know, what, what was to come. This was actually done the day after the hurricane, um, but we, I was actually able to get out of the area where I spent the hurricane was in Guaynabo in the newsroom of Nuevo Lía. Um, and we were stuck in there because there was no way um, on how to get out because of flooding. And this was, this is in Puerta de Tierra. So this is an abandoned building. Um, but for me, the, you know, the, the graffiti behind it, it just evoked this, summary of so many things that we we live with you know with the closure of schools and the 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 constant fight that people have to survive this is in the middle of the island in Patillas area. Um, it was done maybe a week and a half after the hurricane. This photo was taken in Toa Baja um, where it flooded. As you can see, the water went up all the way um, to the door and the community was deeply, deeply affected. Um, This image was in Otuado. Um, this is actually a street um, or a road that was almost watched out by a landslide. And I was with a colleague actually with Chris Gregory who presented um, a few weeks ago and we found a fa family. So the girl in the photo was part of the family and they, their home had pretty much collapsed downhill. And they were able to get out in the middle of the hurricane um, with the winds and, you know, they had to like drag the grandma 
through the middle of the street because the house was starting to collapse after you know rocks and and the dirt came down and they were able to find shelter in a in a abandoned home that was um, a little further up the road. And this was in the very beginning before anybody knew what was to come with the deaths of, um, you know, the, from related to the hurricane. Um, this was in the south of the island and he actually had died um, on the night, like during the hurricane and the mother had driven to the hospital in the middle of the hurricane after she received a call saying that her son was um, was dying. He was he was in his thirties, and this it was not. This was, this was one of the few funeral homes that were open in the area, um, and the funeral home had also had damages. So the owners of the funeral home lived in the second floor of the building, and they also were affected and their you know like they had um water come in and and they had lost some of their things too for me like photographing maria was was very personal because you know it's like i was covering it for news but the truth is like i i it was not something that i was gonna like photo i couldn't photograph it from the outside because it was also something that I was living and going through, like the apartment and that I the apartment that I lived in was severely damaged in the hurricane. So I was going to work and then coming home to to an apartment that didn't have halfway, you know, like doors to the balcony because they had like flown away with the hurricane. Um, and and you know I was like going through it as I, as I was documenting it. So I think there was a layer of like understanding the situation a bit deeper in a way. I don't, um, just because I was also going through it. I think there, there was like, um, this happened quite a few times where uh, people, you know, like since I would work mostly with reporters that are not from Puerto Rico, uh, you would arrive in a community or to a family that, that you were talking to. Sorry. Did it freeze up for everyone? Trauma that was happening. Okay. Go for it. Okay. Are you, uh, did everyone hear that? Or was it just me? Did it stop? Sorry. Yeah, for a second. I was about to be like, oh, did the power go out? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, okay. no. Okay, yeah, it froze. Oh, hi, Paul. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, only that part. Um, the, I think after you said the, you don't work, you work with reporters not from Puerto Rico. Uh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Okay. Yeah, I no, thought no. for a second that the power had gone out because we, <laughs> when we did a tech check, uh, Erica and I were like, okay, so what's the plan if the, because she's in Puerto Rico right now, and that's like just the reality. <laughs> so yeah. if it happens, you'll probably see me like, oh, wait, are you guys, is everyone here? Like, <laughs> just in case, because I'm like anticipating, like, <laughs> it will be okay. It will be okay. The power going out. I have some faith. I have some faith. <laughs> okay. Okay. Oh, uh, you can keep going now. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Um, so what was I saying? Um, so that, that, that there was this like entire unspoken um, conversation that happened when, when, you know, when like me and the person I was photographing and that was like working with would, would understand that, 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 that I lived here and that I lived through the hurricane that I was also affected. You know, it was just a different, um, I'm not going to say that it makes it better or worse. It's just like a different way to connect to people because, you know, we, we understood all the trauma and the pain and the loss that that had come with this hurricane and that every single person had had to endure um across the entire island i one of the things that i did during the hurricane um when I was staying in the newsroom in, in Nuevo Dia for about a week and a half, 
uh, since you know there were no they were they were delivering the newspaper the printed newspaper and there was like no internet to for anybody to connect to um, and get the news uh, one of the things that we were asked to do and since I was like going out to photograph um, and document um, was to take the printed newspapers and pretty much deliver them so that I would stack up my passenger seat and floor with printed newspapers and everywhere I stopped and I saw someone I would like give them a paper um, because nobody really knew like there were no news there was like one radio station working um, so it was it's something that I like remember I actually in in my family's hometown in Calle I went to make some photos and I, I got out in a yelera um, where, how do you say that? Where you go buy ice. <laughs> and I made some photos. And then after, you know, after I left, I just kind of returned and, and gave the people newspapers. And I was like, here you go. And because everybody kept asking me, like, why hasn't anybody arrived? This was maybe four days after the hurricane. Um, why hasn't anybody um, uh, come to help us what's happening and I would be like you you know this is like throughout the entire island everybody's being affected and and when I gave them the newspaper I remember that that day was the day where they printed uh, Teresa Canino had gone on a helicopter and who's a local photographer for in Nuevo Dia uh, had documented in aerial photos the state of the of while the island was and it was actually you know it was very shocking those first images and i remember when i gave out the newspapers people were just like surround you know like everybody was surrounding just looking at the images like oh my god look at this right like everybody was still in shock because we were all still kind of discovering the extent of the damage this is actually do you want to say it? Go, 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 go for it. Someone says that Yelera is translated ice plant. Ice plant, I didn't, thank you. Yo no sabía eso. Also, I think you might have to turn your captions on again on Google Slides. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. I think it, there we go. Okay, cool. <laughs> thank you. Um, so, sorry. Give me one second. So I wanted to talk about um, this image. This is a story um, I did for the New York Times. It was 11 months after the hurricane, so August of 2018. And we were trying to find, you know, like uh, PREPA, so the Power uh, Electric Authority of Puerto Rico was saying that they just had like one or two houses left and that they were going to connect everybody to, to the electric grid. Um, and, but they were not actually giving us information. Um, we were trying to like figure out where it was, but the, the company was really not um, letting us know, you know, giving us information. Um, to where, where this family or where this area was. Uh, but we did hear that, um, that it was in this town in Ponce. And this is Jasmine Mejias and her son, one of her sons, she has um, a younger girl and an older son. And we found the family kind of pretty much by luck, you know, like in journalism, sometimes you just run into luck. We knew it was in Ponce and we asked around and they told us the area and the neighborhood that it was in. Um, and we, the first person we asked that we stopped pretty much like driving on a road in a car that was coming by was a community leader. So he knew where she was. So he was just like, oh, no worries. I'll take you, I know the house. Um, so we ended up um, at her house and the family like opened the doors to us and Frances Robles who's the reporter for the New York Times and um, we, we spent uh, some time with them and then I asked um, the, my, my editor at the New York Times if, if there was interest that I would love to go and spend the night with them and spend time, you know, like the, in that process of those last nights without power. They also did not have um, water service and, and, and wait until they got the power back. So document that process and this photo is actually in the morning. So I spent the night um, in their house, this was in Ponce, but like way up in the mountains, almost Hayuya. 
and and this was the first day of school and they're they're signing papers that that he has to take to school um and he had also changed schools because it was after the closure of school so there was like multiple layers of of um the things that have been happening in puerto rico this is the family of natalio eh, who passed away um, in January after the, the hurricane, uh, after his uh, apnea machine, his breathing machine for the sleep apnea, I'm sorry, uh, turned off because the, the, um, the generator ran out of gas um, and he died at his house. And I covered this story with John Sutter um, for CNN. Uh, this was his grave. Um, many in Ma this was in Maunabo in the south, and the cemetery was dozens of tombs like this that were pretty much just like makeshift into like making it quick and just writing it um, on top of the concrete because there was no there there was having so many deaths and they couldn't like keep up with with doing a formal tomb like how it's customary to do them here. I'm gonna go through the ones from Ricky Renuncia. Uh, so it's, you know, coverage from the 12 days of protests that ended up in the ousting of Ricardo Rosello. This photograph was actually taken in his last um, public press conference. And I photo, I made way too many images because I was trying to get it to look like an official portrait, but he was just standing as someone else was on the podium speaking about, you know, the protest and that that had happened and the riots that had happened the days before. Oh, someone has a, a question. Yeah. If you want me to read now? Please. Uh, someone's asking, are there issues using or publishing your own photos, copyright and ownership, when they are from new, new news projects like CNN or the New York Times? Oh, and this is something I've asked you before, actually. <laughs> like, are there issues, like, I, I don't quite... Like, um, if, like, of using or publishing your own photos when they are from news projects like CNN or the New York Times, like a good example, I guess a good example would be that um, I asked you something about the copyright in New York Times and you have shared copyright oh, and yeah. some of the photos that you showed from the New York Times I included in, in the show, in the exhibition. So Yeah, it's so, so it really it really depends on the client and the contract. It's, it's, it's different with every publication. Um, with the New York Times is shared copyright so I can use my work, it, I own my work. Um, so I can use it without any problem. Some other publications, it really depends. The embargoes are longer, which means that I can like, I can't publish them anywhere else um, for a longer period of time or, or sometimes they just keep the copyright. That's what I try to avoid the most. I wanna own my work. This was actually after the, the, this was during the, fir the first like protest against uh, Wanda Vasquez. Um, it, it was before she took power, but it was when, when she was like the next person in line, um, there was a protest in front of the Department of Justice in Atorrey. This is when she signed, when Wanda Vasquez Garcet became governor. And I will, uh, I actually wanted to say something about um, Ricky Renuncia that, so this night, this was the night that he ended up quitting. Um, and the photo on the left is how full the street was dur during the Perreo Combativo gathering. Um, 
and gathering and protest. And then on the right, you have um, a group of, of guys listening to the message that um, the governor used to quit that was posted on Facebook. So I want to say that when that happened, I was outside on the street and everybody was like telling each other to shut up so they could actually like listen to what was being said um, on the message. Um, and I remember some people even like, like screaming, just like, why wouldn't he just like say it quickly, you know, because he, he did a quite a long message. Um, and then, you know, when he said that he would quit on August, I think second or third, um, you know, the, the street just broke into celebration. And I remember just standing there and I couldn't even photograph. I was just like so in so much shock because I, I didn't think that he was going to quit, to be honest, that night. And... And I, I don't think I made any justice to document the moment um, that I had in front of me because I think I was, I was a bit in shock because I was, I was not expecting, you know, to have a governor ousted by protest in this island. And then this, some of these photos are part of the, the coverage of the earthquakes that happened in January 6 and the 5.8 earthquake and then the 6.4 and January 7 and all the aftershocks that came after that. There were about 3,000 um, smaller earthquakes and, and not so small um, since December 28th forward. It's still moving now. There's still earthquakes happening um, in the south of the island. This was in a shelter, um, actually the first night, so this was on Three Kings Day on January 6th, and people had, had moved to take in shelter. This is in Guanica, um, in, in a coliseum, and then the next day after the stronger one that happened on January 7th when I went in, um, many of the light bulbs from the state, from the, from the location had broken down and had actually like fallen on some of the people. I don't think it injured anybody, but it, after that, then everybody was, had just like moved to camp outside in an open area. This is a boy in a family. There was actually like four families that were camping next to one of the main roads in Guanica. Um, this was a few days, maybe three or four days after the main earthquake. Um, and I just loved the moment. I waited for, you know, like things to align a little bit um, as he was just like, you know, involved in watching his cartoons in, you know, hanging in a hammock in the next side of the road while his parents, you know, worried about where they were going to sleep. Everybody was actually like spending the night on chairs. Um, and only the kids were, were sleeping in mattresses. So all the, all the people in these photographs were, were staying there and, and the guy and the, the people that you see on the right were spending the nights sitting on plastic chairs. And I think that's it. That's, I think, the last one. I would love to talk. I feel it's so weird to do it with, without having, like, a conversation or, like, looking at people's faces. <laughs> we have um, a question, actually, uh, that we just got. So, uh, yeah, and we have, like, 20-ish minutes left. So um, we can, the rest of it can be a conversation if people want sure. to use the chat or... Uh, the Q&A. It seems like the Q&A is working, so you can use either one, because I'll read it out loud anyway. <laughs> so do you, so want, do you want me to stop sharing the screen? Oh, no, I think you can keep sharing if, if you're fine with me reading it out loud to you. I don't know okay. if you can see it, because um, then that way, if you want to point to a photo, you have it ready. Oh, perfect. So uh, Mariela says, you talked about shifting the narrative around Puerto Rican identity and experience as part of your work's purpose. And I was wondering if you have any anecdotes of moments when you were faced with resistance, backlash, or even just confusion from a publisher or client because they had a different expectation from your work or the Puerto Rican imagery you brought. Um, mucho cariño para ti siempre, amiga querida. <laughs> 
Um, honestly, not that I can think of that anybody, um, any editor would like directly say anything. Um, I think I've always been very vocal, even, you know, before I started freelancing full time, um, about like not trying to, you know, do those images of like the helpless Puerto Ricans and the cliches of like the paradise and, you know, the coconuts and all of like all of that iconography that that it's so uh, stereotypical and that simplifies the reality of, you know, like Puerto Ricans and our stories. Um, I, I, not that I can think of, um, but, but I have seen it and I do see, I mean, I mean, not every publication, but I do know that some publications lean more towards that. And it's something I see, you know, if I have some specific images that I know are a bit more, um, traditional in the sense of like, what would show Puerto Rico, uh, being like, uh, that they would use those images instead of the others, you know? Um, so, but I, I, I try, what I try to do is not do them. Um, and then I've had this conversation before with other photographers and another um, panel that I was in a few years ago about the images that I didn't make. Um, there, were, there were a lot of photos that I didn't make during the hurricane um, because I knew that they, and you know, this is something that it's a complete discussion over the photojournalism world, just because it's like, that's the truth because it's in front of you. But I think we hold more responsibility than that, than just like snapping an image because it's in front of you and they make that the truth than, you know, like taking our camera with responsibility on how we represent people. And especially in like moments where people are super vulnerable um, and, and are, you know, at the, you know, like during, during a disaster. Um, so I, I can't think of specific images, uh, to be honest, but I know there were, there were moments that I was just like, I'm, I'm not going to make that photo. Um, just because I know it, it just feeds into the stereotypical narrative and, and I don't want to like make my work be that. I'm trying not to. I'm not going to say that I've never done it. Probably. Um, I'm still, you know, trying to work on that, but I'm not perfect. But um, yeah, I don't know if I made, I made sense, but that's my little <laughs> rant. <laughs> okay, so uh, from the chat, Oh, someone from earlier said, thank you. Um, it sounds like photographers really need to look carefully at the contracts and copyrights regarding the question you had earlier. Um, and then uh, we have a couple questions. Uh, you're, okay, so I'm gonna read, how do you distinguish between hurricane suffering in colonized Puerto Rico and in the mainland for, in Florida? Florida, USA, not Florida, the pueblo. <laughs> Can you read it again? Sorry. Yeah. How do you distinguish between hurricane suffering in colonized Puerto Rico and in the mainland like Florida? I've never covered Florida, so I, it's a bit hard for me to like put an opinion when I haven't been to a place. Um, but let me think about this for a second. I don't think I can talk visually about it. I mean, it's a sense of like photography, if the, this is what the person's asking. Um, just because I'm not that familiar with the visual language that comes out of Florida. Like I've seen it, I have some colleagues that work there, but it's not like in the top of my head, I'm not, I can't, I don't feel like I can make a solid statement about that. Um, but I do think, you know, that the coverage of stories in Puerto Rico turns different because everything, you know, the, the, the colonial relationship with the United States and all of what that entails um, always influences the stories that are told here. And, and you know, the, um, the lens through which we're viewed, not, not lens on photography wise, but uh, on narrative wise, it's always there. Um, on, on, on that, that ungovernability, right? Like, and, and we have a long way to go, but I think that always comes out in, in, in coverage of Puerto Rico that I don't know if, it, if it's, you know, like 
reported the same and if it was a state. Yeah, this question makes me want to go back to see the coverage of Hurricane Harvey in Texas and Louisiana, which was one month before Maria. Um, now I need to revisit that. Time doesn't mean anything anymore. It's, <laughs> it's crazy that that happened that in 2017. Um, but yeah, it would be good to, to make a comparison, especially with Florida. Um, yeah. Especially like the Puerto Ricans who moved to Florida, to, like at, who moved after Hurricane Maria and then Florida still gets a lot of bad hurricanes. Mm -hmm. I wonder what their perspective of that would be. So that's a, that's a good question. Um, yeah, thank you um, for that question. Who made it? I can't read it, but thank you. <laughs> yeah, and thinking of like the comparisons made with Hurricane Katrina or like um, how they said like, oh, it's not like it's a Katrina, but it, it kind of, it was. Mm -hmm. um, it's, well, it was always played down, you know, um, and it was always played down. I think also, I mean, like you, you, you can be factual and say that it was a category four and it was not a category five because it was missing one mile um, to reach mm -hmm. category right. five. But, you know, there, the, it's little things that sometimes, you know, I don't even know how to say it. It's like show, show, show that, you know, show like how sometimes things here just like run differently because of, you know, where we are. Yeah. And, and not to answer the question for you, but like in uh, Hurricane Katrina, when it happened, I think something distinct about Puerto Rico is how trapped you feel on an island. You can't just like be driven to another state, which is what happened with Hurricane Katrina in, in New Orleans. But at the same time, being like driven to another state for, for safety caused a lot of families to be separated during Hurricane Katrina. So I think in Puerto Rico, something distinct is how trapped you are in a little island and big water. So. <laughs> yeah, but I do, I mean, it's also something that ha like this family separation here was a huge deal after mm -hmm. um, the hurricane. Um, there were multiple people that, that I mm -hmm. photographed that, and I, I remember he's, the, his picture is not here. Um, an older man in Comerio who, you know, let us go into his home and we were talking and he was, he was sharing with us how depressed he was and how worried he was because his daughter, um, had left because she had two kids and she had to leave, um, because, you know, how things were not really improving, but mm -hmm. how, how much that was affecting him because now he was alone and, and it was a lot harder for him. And that's something that I, I heard a lot, you know, and I think it's also an issue of, in Puerto Rico, how we have um, our population, it's, it's uh, aging and most of our population, it's older and that's, that's gonna, you know, bring up a whole other um, issues and stories. But, but when it came to that, you know, we lost a lot of people that, you know, a lot of po a part of the population moved to the United States because they, they felt it was the, it was the right decision for them um, in the middle of the chaos that was happening, but that also, you know, it's like, also we have to like, what's the, to look at what's the effect here um, to some of the people that are the most vulnerable. And he, um, they had actually um, followed up on that question um, right after um, and added maybe a better way to put this, is there a different visual approach to take of Puerto Rico, Hawaii, Guam, mainland reservations and other subordinate areas? But again, since you haven't photographed outside, I don't know if that uh, changes here. <laughs> Can you read it again? Yeah. Um, is there a different visual approach to take of Puerto Rico, Hawaii, Guam, mainland reservations, and other, uh, quote, subordinate areas? Yeah, um, definitely. That question is more clear <laughs> to my brain. <laughs> um, I think definitely because of m multiple things, it's like mainly, I mean, for me, right? And one of the things that drives me or like that, that pushes me is that um, all of our communities have not been documented by their people, right? Like it's always been an outside lens that has actually built and fee fed this um, stereotypical representation of a place where, where it's like the same images repeat. doesn't matter if 20 years go by, they always have the woman 
cleaning clothes at the river and a lechon, you know, and the woman dancing bon by Loisa, it just becomes like this stereotypical thing, right? And I'm only talking about Puerto Rico, but it's, it's, it happens in a lot of other communities. And I think, um, you know, now that we have easier access to photography and there's more opportunities for, for communities that were very underrepresented before, um, to, you know, take that power and say, no, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to take the pictures, you know, like we are going to tell the stories and, and how to use the camera as, you know, a, a, it's, it's a political tool, right? It's not, it's not just like, oh, let's go make pretty pictures, right? It's, it's, there, there's something that, that drives the work that, that I do and that I know photographers, not just Puerto Ricans, but, but people from underrepresented communities and minorities, and though I don't like to use the word minorities, but um, youth, because you, you, you want to you wanna change uh, the stories that are being told about one of our communities. Um, so I do think that, yes, we need to approach it differently. And, and it's not to say that someone that it's not from a community cannot photograph it, but there's one thing, it's also like, if you're gonna go into someone else's community, you should try to uplift them. Um, if there's no opportunities there, or, or if there's someone locally that is doing the work, but they're not that well known, I think that's like the responsibility that, that one has um, in, one, in one hand. And, and I think it's also, um, if you're an outsider, like you have the responsibility to educate yourself, to, to represent this, uh, the place that you're documenting um, in a sensible way. Um, Educated and sensible way. We have a few more questions. Um, I, sorry to read this out of order, because uh, it's Always. just that one says, I love this photo that's posted now. What does it depict? It certainly looks like patriarchal government, but that was about five or six minutes ago. So I don't know if it was this photo or one that you had before, if the person's still on. Oh, it's, prob it's probably the, the, I think this it was one. Before. Yeah. Wait, let me do this. I feel it's going to be easier if I do this. Yeah, whichever photo you had at open at 12.45 p.m. <laughs> yeah, it was this one. It was this one. That one, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah um what does it depict yeah looks like <laughs> this, is that, this is the so this was taken um during um after ricky rosello ricardo rosello had, had um said that he was gonna leave uh his post as governor <laughs> and they were debating if um or trying to make a decision if pierre luisi could Pedro Pierluisi could take power, um, and and this is the the PNP caucus uh, trying to make a decision. So the uh, PNP Pro, Partido Este Nuevo Progresista, and I, I actually party. this is yeah this is this is not like these are not places that I like go into. This is actually the first time that I had been in there to make photos, just because like I don't I don't cover much local polit politics so. Um, it, it was like a new place for me. It was hard to shoot in there. The light was really tough, but, but I think it was, for me, it was just like so intriguing, you know, like there's one woman in the, there's actually two women in the picture or three. They're all, they're, all of them are to the left, but yes, um, this is, these are the decision makers. And, and this person also had a question. Um, they said, your photos are gorgeous. Any thoughts about what it means to take beautiful photographs um, about traumatic events and circumstances? So beauty and trauma. <laughs> hmm. Let me think. Um, I think there were very fine lines of, of um, exploitation and documentation and and it's really up to the person that's behind the lens to like question that for in one part and I, I mean I also think that you know we use photography to communicate and 
We want people to look at the images. We want to make beautiful work because we want people to engage. And I mean, we hope that people can feel, um, even if it's through like a beautifully aesthetic image, even if it's like a very painful moment or, or if it's through like a more rough, messier frame. Um, I, I, I think this is a very long conversation to have. Like I would love to have it with this person because it's like an eternal <laughs> debate um, that I don't know. I just think they're fine lines. I think it really depends on the intention of the person that's behind the camera um, and, and the effects that that, that that work ends up having, you know, to in, in, in the long run or to, to the audience that's seeing it. We have another question uh, from another person. Um, they say, Brava, Erika, uh, these are incredible documents. What's your assessment of the current state of journalism on the island? And are you covering the primary election crisis? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not covering it. Um, I debate it, but I'm not, I'm not covering it. Um, taking, taking a little bit of a break, <laughs> uh, but watching it, watching it from, from, you know, very little distance what's happening and a bit dumbfounded. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and what was the first part of the question? What's your assessment uh, of the current state of journalism on the island? I think something that happened recently was that local journalists were um, denouncing how they give all the stories to mostly David Begnaud <laughs> and how Begnaud reported on the election crisis before any of the local journalists did. I don't know if you were involved in any of that, but I no, saw that I happening. wasn't. I, I wasn't. <laughs> I think that's just kind of you know that's decision making inside the government. That's yeah. not that's. That's not up to us. If you ask any local journalist would be probably say that, but you know, it's like people can spend months asking for interviews and not get them. Ask the Centro de Periodismo Investigativo and they will tell you. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I don't know. I don't, I don't know how to answer that, to be honest. I mean, I, I think there's a lot of issues. I think um, we've lost a ton of journalists. We've lost a ton of photojournalists in the past five years. Um, there is barely any staff people um, in the local in the local publications. It's like it's it's like a serious issue, um, and 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 that also affects you know like how how our stories are presented or not or told. Um, and, and also, you know, it's, it's not up to the journalists, many of the things that happen here. Um, I, I, good colleagues and friends who report locally, who work their life out trying to make the best work. Um, but sometimes that's not possible. And it's not even up to them, but but I, you know, like journalism is a struggle. It's a, it's a, like reporting in Puerto Rico. It's, it's not, I don't think it's an easy job, you know? Um, and, and I'm very proud of all my, all my um, colleagues in, in Puerto Rico because they've helped me. And not just because of that, but because, you know, we, the, little by little, we try to bring justice to what we can. And there's things that are not great about it. I'm not, you know, like you can't, you can't deny that. Uh, I think one of the things that, and I actually like made some comments about this recently, how um, last weekend a woman was raped by five people, by five men. And two days later, not even the day after, the story was not in the cover of any of the local um, newspapers. And it's still not in the cover of the local newspapers. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's, there's, you know, there's layers into decision making. And I do understand that, you know, the primaries and the debacle that we have with the democracy and the primaries 
Um, it's a huge issue, but they're like that can't uh, trump over over other stories that also need to be told and that uh, need to be investigated um, because that's our job to push for for those things to happen too. You know, to bring bring um, truth to power. It's cliche, but it is right. Like if we don't don't do that, um, it's easier for like things to fall through the crack and and yeah I don't know it's a story that I fo I'm following closely just because it's a horrendous thing that happened and it's more shocking that it's not being talked about um and that the victim it's being victimized um a thousand times through social media um and even the news and the headlines and the way is been um in some of the places how it's been reported on. So I don't know, I, I can complain about that story for the entire day. It's just, you yeah. know. Yeah, the epidemic of machismo that doesn't, isn't really yeah. covered uh, a lot. Well, the people who are covering it are usually Puerto Rican women who are like struggling to get these stories out there. And this story that just happened last week of the five rapists in Añasco, which is actually my, hometown I saw people local like my friends were posting about it before I saw any news report they were just like we're hearing this thing going on um, and there's barely any good reports out there now they're very skewed and mm -hmm. yeah but um, <laughs> there's also a lot of things that happen that need to happen politically to deal with um, the violence against women um, humongous problem that we have that that is not happening you know that most of the work it's being done by um nonprofits and activists mm -hmm. so there's still a long way to go <laughs> and we're uh out of time now we have only two comments so i'll just read them to you so you know <laughs> um someone says i'm from south africa and don't get to meet many puerto ricans thanks for creating work that is representative of the people of puerto rico um and someone else says excellent presentation and terrific work thank you <laughs> thank you yeah so and thank you erica from the mocp for uh for being a part of this and being a part of the show temporal um, uh, again, Temporal is up until September 19th by reservation in Chicago. So if anyone is interested in going in person and seeing Erika's work in, in person as well, uh, and you're in Chicago, uh, feel free to make a reservation and stopping by the Museum of Contemporary Photography. And someone's asking, asking is this recorded for viewing again? Um, and I was just about to say that actually, yes, we are recording this and we will post it on the museum's Vimeo page. Um, and you can also find it if you go to MOCP and go to past events, because now this will be listed as a past event and you just click on Erika P. Rodriguez behind the lens. It'll be on that page as well, linked there. Um, so you can either click on the same event page and it'll show you the Vimeo embedded or you can go to um, our MOC, just Google MOCP Vimeo and we have all the all the behind the lens presentations. There's a virtual tour of Temporal actually put up there now. Um, so you can uh, watch all of that um, on our Vimeo page. And more thank yous, um, like three people saying thank you, incredible presentation. <laughs> this is thank you, good. thank you for having me. <laughs> and thank you for also, you know, like doing this, this show, right? Like bringing light into the Puerto Rican stories and and two other Puerto Rican artists, you know, it's a bunch of us in it. So it's, I wish I could be there, you know, if there wasn't a <laughs> pandemic, I think a lot of us would have made it to Chicago. Yeah, and uh, Erica was actually the first photographer I met with for the show. The first person <laughs> I, I talked to, I think the first person that was included. So everything was kind of, every decision I made after curatorially was based on like the two hours that we spent having coffee at, Don, Don Pedro, was it? <laughs> no, I mean, like, Don Juan, Cafe Don Juan. Don Juan. That's <laughs> it's true, I forgot about that. Yeah, yeah, it inspired like what you were talking about, the cotidianidad, daily life after 
the hurricane and everything you said, I wrote down and like took into account. So, so it's nice that you were able to present because yeah, like just thank the, you. Fun Thank fact, you. she was the first person and, I met with. <laughs> yeah. And Natalia is presenting next, right? Natalia Lasalle yes. Murillo. That was, I almost Watch forgot. Out. Yes. Yeah. Next week, Natalia Lasalle Murillo, another artist in the show, who um, her work is La Ruta, a video installation, um, is uh, presenting also about her work. So make sure to tune in uh, next Friday at the same time for a Behind the Lens with Natalia Lasalle Murillo. <laughs> I just have All to right. spread the love. <laughs> <laughs> okay all right thank, thank you. you have a good bye. day bye <laughs>